So now I'd like to introduce our next panel to discuss mental health and cancer survivors. In our annual State of Cancer Survivorship Survey, cancer survivors, including those in active treatment, those with metastatic disease, and those in long-term survivorship, report significant mental health challenges, including depression and anxiety. They also report that the cancer care system is not always responsive to their mental health needs, or that there is poor coordination of care and communication among providers, even if they receive quality mental health care services. The pandemic has exacerbated mental health issues for some, and the isolation of the pandemic has posed a challenge for all cancer survivors. Our panelists today include Dr. Tamron Gray of the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and Harvard Medical School, Susan Headland, an oncology social worker and director of patient and family services at the Oregon Health, Sci Health and Science University, and two outstanding patient advocates, Patsy Henson and Winora Johnson. I'd like to start again with our patient advocates to bring us a patient perspective on this important topic. I'm gonna to turn it over first to Patsy. Thank you so much. So nice to be here. Um, I was thinking as I uh, listened to the other speakers who were wonderful by the way, um, that my viewpoint is very different than theirs. Um, and I don't think it's just about being an advocate. I think one of the things that it made me think of is that I see so many different cancer centers and working so many different settings. And um, I think that's different than those, um, those other providers that primarily worked in one or two cancer centers. But I just wanted to mention that um, I, a couple of years ago, I started a blog, and I want to read you a very short sentence that I wrote in that blog. As if the world collapsed and I was in a deep hole, like an alien had taken over my body and I was somewhere else. And that's how it felt to me when after a year, I was finally diagnosed with late stage cancer. And after that, I started seeing other people with that same experience. And I decided, you know, it's time for us to do something about this. And I was convinced that I could do that because I could work with others and that it was something that hopefully other people wouldn't have to go through. So that's kind of a little bit about me. Thank you so much, Patsy. Mm -hmm. um, how about Winora? Would you share, us, share with us about your experience? Well, thank you, Shelly, for being here. And I myself, I'm a, I'm a cancer survivor and um, I'm thankful for at least the opportunity to be able to share my story and talk to others. That's kind of been a little bit of my life-saving moments that's helped me. But what I'm experiencing now, I call myself a virtual caregiver for my brother who suffers from late stage colon cancer. Um, trying to talk with him um, about his health and about COVID, what we're going through right now uh, for a person who has mental health challenges that he's had most of his life. Um, he needs that backbone and support too, just to keep him connected to the family, um, talking about treatment, um, ask just simple things like asking how his day has gone. And then, um, just talking to him uh, about the, the pan pandemic and those feelings of isolation, because they're, they're worse now than they've ever been before. Thank you, Nora. Uh, so now I'm gonna ask Dr. Gray to, to share your comments, opening comments. Uh, thank you so much, Shelly. I am delighted to be a part of this esteemed panel uh, today, and I am looking forward to the discussion. You know, I just want to really, so I'm a health services researcher and an oncology and bone marrow transplant nurse by training. Uh, I've had uh, over 12 years of experience caring for individuals who are uh, facing such a life-changing diagnosis. You know, one of the things that uh, I think about when I think about the word cancer is that it impacts the individual, it impacts families and the communities in which they reside. And as we think about today, I'm hoping that we'll get to this in the discussion, but when we think about mental illness and cancer, we have to understand that it is, uh, you know, the mental illness is a part of the individual. Uh, so sometimes cancer is not always at the top of their minds like it is for clinicians, you know, oncology clinicians is at that. 
uh, you know, sometimes it's the stress and worries, it's the anxiety and depression. Uh, we know that research shows that anxiety and depression are common, especially in long-term uh, cancer survivors than in their healthy peers with no history of cancer. We know that uh, you know, there's a number of issues in which cancer survivors think about that can impact their overall quality of life and mental health, such as fear of recurrence, such as uh, body image issues, uh, uh, struggles with family and finances, sexuality, and other long-term health needs in terms of thinking about follow-up appointments uh, with, their, uh, with their primary care provider. And then when we think about the cancer diagnosis, how it can already exacerbate uh, a scenario in which someone already has serious mental health uh, illness. Uh, sometimes people who are facing both mental health and cancer are facing a combined uh, issues that makes it more challenging for them to cope. And sometimes mental illness can cause uh, fear and disorganized thinking, which is really problematic when you're facing a cancer treatment uh, where there's ample uh, opportunities of decision making along the whole entire trajectory from treatment to uh, quality of life issues. You know, one of and you know one of the things that I'm really concerned about as a clinician and as a researcher is the fact that we do not communicate as well as we could um, among the clinician side for these for patients who are diagnosed with cancer and who have a mental illness. The lack of communication creates so many challenges with coordinated care, making it very difficult for patients and families to complete treatment. I myself am a caregiver, and uh, that is one of my uh, passions. That's one of my research interests in really focusing on the entire family with, uh, after a serious illness diagnosis. Um, you know, and when, when I think about the lack of coordination in the systems, when I think about the lack of support that the whole family has, it's imperative, it's going to make a difference and it's going to impact and exacerbate feelings of anxiety, hopelessness and depression. Uh, one thing I do want to uh, kind of pay attention, kind of note is that there's a lot of negative aspects of cancer survivorship, but there's also a lot of positive uh, changes that can happen as a result of cancer survivorship that I hope we'll get into more uh, today as well as um, really a few recommendations uh, that the literature has shown us in terms of supporting cancer survivors, especially those who are facing mental health issues. Thank you very much, Dr. Gray. Um, now I'd like Susan Hedlund to make your opening comments. Thank you, Shelley. And I'm going to echo what others have said about what an honor it is to be invited to participate in this event today. And having known both Ellen Stovall and Betsy Clark, um, I really want to do a shout out to um, the National Coalition of Cancer Survivors, really powerful women that did wonderful work. Um, I, um, as Shelley mentioned, I'm a licensed clinical social worker and I uh, have the great privilege of um, directing our program of patient family support at Oregon Health and Sciences University, which is an NCI designated Knight Cancer Institute um, um, tertiary cancer center in Portland, Oregon. Um, and I, 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 I wanna comment a little bit about um, what's already been mentioned in terms of the, the fact that the cancer patients often tell us that they struggle with anxiety and depression and fear about the future. And um, many patients, we're starting to hear them talk about what we call post-traumatic stress disorder as well. Uh, some patients come to us already experiencing distress and PTSD from life experience, and then the cancer experience layered on top of that um, can make it even more complex. And as has been mentioned, our services don't always take care of patients the way we want to uh, in terms of really taking care of the whole person and communicating well with one another. Um, it's been an interesting year to say the least. And one of the things I was uh, sharing with Shelley is um, I am the mental health provider on Oregon's disaster medical assistance team. And my role in, in that is to go to disaster sites and provide mental health services for people who are impacted by the disaster, but also to provide mental health services and support for the first responders who too uh, experience a lot of distress. It's been really remarkable to me how much that my background in disaster medicine has really paralleled both the cancer experience and also the pandemic. Uh, and because we see that people have been so 
uh, drastically impacted by the pandemic uh, and the experience of depression and grief and anxiety and loneliness and isolation um, has been really in, in, dramatically exacerbated because of the pandemic. Um, the other thing that, that I, I have found myself doing a lot of this year is trainings for community mental health workers as well as the, the healthcare workforce around disaster response and what the psychological impact is. There's a graph that comes out of Johns Hopkins that though it is a bit dated, it was created in, in 2010, I've been using it in all of our trainings because it's the, um, it's the disaster response trajectory. And many of us can identify with that because in the beginning, there was almost a honeymoon-like response of, I've got this, I can go home for a couple months, I can figure this out. And then as we realized that this wasn't gonna be over anytime soon, uh, what we started to see was disillusionment. And the greatest risks um, psychologically were forecasted for the fall and the winter when we were um, in this period of disillusionment. And now if we're going according to the graph, um, we're beginning to start to rebuild, to recover from our grief and see hope on the horizon. All year long, it has really struck me that this is very parallel to what our cancer patients experience. You know, the beginning of, of a sense of I've got this, perhaps followed by disillusionment and, and eventual healing and recovery. Um, we, we know that the people who have been most at risk during this period of time um, have been young adults, people of color, frontline workers, unpaid caregivers, um, and we too as healthcare providers are living the pandemic as well and we are not immune uh, from some of those symptoms. And I think the, the gift of that is it's a collective experience. And, and it does create, I think, more, more intimacy amongst us. Interestingly, um, in the disaster world, we talk about psychological first aid. And what that is, is, is simply listening, listening to people's stories. And we see that very powerful recovery that happens uh, in support groups around that very thing of listening to each other, sharing stories, identifying with one another's experiences. And some of the things that we're already starting to see um, that, again, parallel the cancer patient experience is what we call actual post-traumatic growth. And that is used to describe how as we get through a very difficult experience, such as cancer, such as a pandemic, uh, we may see that we have a new, renewed perspective on what's truly important for us, be them our personal relationships, our sense of priorities, our sense of purpose, a, a discovered sense of inner strength that we may not have even known that we had. Um, and while we're not finished yet with the pandemic, I'm starting to see more and more resilience as, as hope comes about. Here in the West, in the fall, we also were hit with all the wildfires. And then certainly nationally, as we dealt with the systemic racism and the tensions that existed nationally, it was as if we had a crisis on top of a crisis on top of a crisis, um, and many people expressing their collective exhaustion. Um, but one of the things we know about post-traumatic recovery is that what we need is a sense of safety, a sense of both individual and collective efficacy, the desire to promote connection, and also a sense of realistic hope. And, and I think in, in calming communication, that's another thing that I think is so important. And again, our patients know this, they've lived this. And I think the isolation that has been imposed by the pandemic has been certainly difficult. The visitation limitations, the fears of coming to the hospitals and being exposed possibly to COVID and the, having to postpone treatment. It, it's been, they've been excruciating decisions unlike a time I've ever seen in my long career. But what I would say is some of the ahas are, you know, uh, telemedicine, telehealth, as, as was talked about in our previous panel, we are seeing far more people uh, pursuing counseling um, via telehealth. Um, I facilitate a number of support groups that pivoted to Zoom. We have greater attendance than we've ever had. You know, one group is for women with ovarian cancer who often have pretty high symptom burden and to drive into town and park and go to the group and drive home and then collapse. Um, you know, our attendance was really low. 
our, our monthly group now has about 25 women that attend uh, that wouldn't have been able to attend previously from the whole region. And like other speakers uh, today, um, Oregon's a very rural state. And so there's some real advantages to that. Um, has, as another speaker mentioned, it's been very painful to not be able to gather, to celebrate, to mourn, to uh, really collectively heal. Um, but as one speaker said, Zoom has become our ally in the sense that it's allowed us to do some of these things. Not the same as being in person, but it's better than being too, too isolated. So I think I'll stop there. Thank you very much. And um, so we can bring up all of the panelists and I would love to start, I have a lot of questions already and I know we'll get some from the audience, but I wanna start with this question. Has the pandemic, uh, there's so much talk about the mental health burden on people during the pandemic. Has the pandemic um, reduced the stigma of mental health challenges? And is that going to help us in the long run that if if, if it's sort of acknowledged that we were, were all sort of facing these challenges in different degrees, that maybe it's not such a problem to talk about mental health challenges now, will that help us going forward? Hey, you wanna take a stab at that? I'll go ahead and start. Um, so I definitely believe that COVID has, has shed light on a lot of issues um, as we think about systemic racism, as we think about uh, isolation, as we think about resource allocation, um, but also as we think about mental health needs. And it's one thing I do want to say is that it's not just, um, you know, cancer survivors that are at risk for mental health uh, issues. They're, you know, we all are um, during this pandemic because it's not easy. It's tough. You know, but one of the things that I think about in terms of the stigma is that COVID has cr increased awareness in terms of the need for mental health, in terms of people recognizing that it is tough, recognizing the reality of the situation. A lot of it is related to the uncertainty of not knowing when it's going to end. That in itself helps to prompt a lot of fear and anxiety just because of the fear of the unknown. You know, but as we think about, is there more... Uh, commercials about online and telehealth related to mental health counseling and apps that you could use to 24-7 uh, talk with a social worker or a psychologist. We also have to recognize that there's a, a workforce shortage. Uh, so when we have more individuals who are open to the idea of uh, mental health services, we also have to be uh, realistic and know that we don't have the entire, um, we don't have adequate uh, clinicians to address these issues. So it makes me think about also the need for educating our other clinicians and even lay uh, peers uh, for, for support and for being able to at least address the initial stages of mental health services, whether that be listening uh, or being able to uh, provide distress screening tools. That's something that not just mental health counselors can do with validated survey measures in the clinical settings. So I think when we think about the increased awareness that people have with mental health services, uh, there is still a stigma. Uh, people are still open to talking about cancer and not about mental health issues. Um, and, but we do have to recognize that the workforce uh, shortage exists. And we need to be creative with solutions to make sure that people's needs are being addressed. I would, I would agree with that. And I, I think another group that has been very much at risk are healthcare providers. And healthcare providers are not known for their uh, enthusiasm about seeking mental health services themselves. Um, and I know that uh, many institutions have instituted uh, wellness task forces for their, their communities because uh, we're an exhausted workforce at this stage of things, and um, the risk of suicide, we know, is fairly high among healthcare providers. And so I know our, our local Lines for Life, which is our suicide prevention hotline, set, has set up a special group of services specifically for healthcare providers. I am seeing in my own institution that um, trainees, we just did a, a, a kind of a survey of all this, we, we took a look at the trainees who were pursuing mental health services in our wellness um, uh, center. 
and they've gone way up. And I was really glad to see that, really glad that, that meaning that it, I don't know that they're more distressed than they were before, but they're willing to get help, which I think is really important. Shelley, if, if I can also add that I really appreciate Dr. Gray and Dr. Hedlund's um, um, their information that they're providing, but there's many of us that are, that are juggling multiple family members who are experience, experiencing depression and anxiety. And it may be on a small, small scale, but it's enough that, you know, if you're that one focal point or the big mama of the family trying to hold everyone together, it can be very difficult because you put yourself last and you're trying to help everyone else just to make it through that moment. And so I appreciate these, um, these points about uh, that we need to talk about and how we can um, keep, our, keep it all together during this time. When where can I ask, how have you done that? Because I, I, I'm surmising you're the mama in your family. <laughs> I, I am the big mama, the big sister. I am pretty much it all. And I just keep thinking when I went through my cancer diagnosis and, and I wanted to be the person that not tell anyone because I wanted to be that strong uh, black woman in the family and realizing that maybe sometimes I'm doing a little bit more harm than good, letting my family in, letting them help me, letting them take a little bit of more ownership um, uh, in helping mom because mom needs help too. And that's where I realized I let other family members help me. And in turn, to show that appreciation, then I give back. So my brother who suffers from a mental health condition and is not able to, um, uh, you know, uh, hang out with family or do anything with family because he lives in a uh, assisted living facility. I've become, like I said, that virtual caregiver, making sure that he gets his little daily dose. And that's all he needs, just a little bit, just to keep encouraging him that, you know, I'm here for you. I'm, 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 I'm your big sister's sister. And to me, that, that's enough. It makes me feel good at the end of the day that I'm doing my part. I would agree with, with what you said, um, when, uh, when our, because I think that part of the problem too, but I think something we tend to forget about that I don't hear much about um, when we talk about what we've been through the last year is this idea of dealing with conflict. I think we're putting family members and those of us that are cancer survivors in even more of a position to deal with conflict. And I don't know very many of us that are innately that happy and that good at that. Um, and I think that there's even more of a struggle. And I'm very afraid that what I'm seeing with so many people that are newly diagnosed is that there means there tends to be um, some withdrawing just because this whole system is overwhelmed. And now we're piling on by putting this pandemic on top of it. And I think that um, that, that makes it really hard for people and adds even more stress in the family unit. I had, a, I had a very dear friend that passed away of um, pancreatic cancer and dealing with the communication, even just being able to help them was very, very difficult. So, so yeah, I'm sorry, I, I got, but one of the things I did want to say about that is that um, he was a good example of someone that was dealing with getting services at a regional center and also at a larger center. And just coordinating that was, as an advocate, was almost impossible to do. And I think we have to keep those kind of struggles in mind, you know, also. I would love to return to the conversation that Dr. Gray brought up and, and talk a little bit more about sort of the capacity of the mental health care workforce. Uh, because I think it was stressed before COVID and then with the, you know, increase in people mm -hmm. needing support, it's going to be, you know, it's inadequate to meet the demand. And we hear from, you know, we hear from patients that their, their doctors are not asking them about this. Um, and then we hear from physicians that they're not asking because they don't know what to do when they get the answer. You know, they don't have anybody to refer them to. And I know one of our speakers uh, or when a speaker I heard talking about distress screening at their institution, they're only screening about a third of patients because they don't have the capacity to screen more because they don't have the capacity to help 
the people once they've screened them. So capacity was already a problem and it's just going to get harder. How do we address that? And then also, you know, related, but, you know, there's, there's also, I hear advertisements for different sort of telehealth, um, mental health support. Um, do cancer patients and cancer survivors need cancer specific mental health care, or can they use any source of health, you know, mental health care? I'm kind of asking two questions at once, but they're related. So I'd love to talk more about the workforce and the capacity and how do people find help? I would, I would say yes and relative to, do they have to have cancer specific training, uh, the mental health providers to effectively support uh, people who are cancer survivors? I think it certainly helps. It certainly helps uh, if you've got a psychologist or a social worker or a mental health provider who understands the cancer trajectory. Um, however, that workforce is stretched too. And so I, I think it, it, it is still important for cancer patients to uh, seek mental health services if they feel that they need them. Um, and I wouldn't let the lack of cancer training be the barrier. If we're, the main symptoms are anxiety or depression, um, there's a, a range of providers that can assist with that. But I also think, um, particularly in rural areas, those services are tough to find. Um, there, I was involved at a conference last week on the social determinants of health, and one of the things we're starting to see, which I think will help with that uh, workforce shortage, is we're starting to see embedded mental health providers in primary care clinics. And one of the things that I think is really wonderful about that is it reduces the stigma. And it provides kind of a warm handoff so that uh, the doctor who says, are you depressed? And the patient says, yes, they just walk down the hall and grab the mental health professional and try to coordinate some care. I think there's a real role for that going forward. It not only addresses the issue of stigma, but it addresses the issue of, I don't know what to do if they say, yes, I'm depressed. I think that's such a great point, Susan. Uh, and I was actually thinking along the same lines, the importance of primary care practices and being able to embed mental health services into those practices. Because prior to diagnosis, uh, cancer survivors had a relationship, often have a relationship with their primary care provider. Um, and sometimes that relationship is, um, you know, it's changed during the time of cancer treatment uh, because oftentimes oncologist becomes that person, that main provider. Uh, but I think it's important to recognize the potential that uh, primary care practices can have in terms of their setting being a good setting for having embedded mental health uh, providers there. Uh, the other thing I was going to mention back to Shelley's uh, point about mental health, uh, you know, the mental health care and workforce shortages. When we think about um, you know, workforce uh, concerns and stressors as they're you know, also working with people with cancer and mental health in the midst of COVID. One of the great sources that we have found at our institution uh, in greatest need was uh, the need of palliative care services. So a, a lot of my research focuses on palliative care, which is the specialized medical care that helps uh, to, that focuses on improving quali quality of life and reducing suffering for individuals along the illness trajectory, not just the end of life. And when we think about what's happened during COVID, a lot of colleagues uh, have reached out to my palliative care colleagues just for advice on how to cope with having tough conversations, having to call family members uh, via phone, having to communicate with patients and families via video, having to hold someone's hand at the end of life. These are really tough scenarios for clinicians. Um, but also the palliative care clinicians can also provide a gateway for uh, cancer patients and families, cancer survivors and families, as they're thinking about that next uh, phase of, you know, of just life, <laughs> of thinking about what's happening, what happens after cancer treatment. And also palliative care providers uh, are really trained at helping to facilitate conversations, tough conversations related to prognosis, related to fear, related to anxiety and being able to uh, get language around some of their emotions and how to communicate effectively with the oncology team. Uh, so I think, you know, it's, it's about coordinated care and it's about, uh, yeah, so I'll stop there. But yeah, I, I think there's a plug for primary care practice and palliative care resources during this time. So I have a question from the audience along the lines of the, um, you know, the, the 
mental health care providers or the, you know, the, the um, shortage. Um, and he asks, are there community partnerships with faith-based organizations that might be employed as a stopgap measure? And he re referred to a, a ministry group called Stevens Ministry, where trained volunteers help, uh, help people going through crises. I personally think there's absolutely a role for faith-based communities. In fact, um, I, I periodically uh, work with our local Stevens ministers to help them understand serious illness and what those issues are. And if you go back to the concept of psychological first aid, um, that, that not everybody needs a psychotherapist, but we sure need people that listen to us and can walk with us on the journey. And, and for, for many people, it's their faith communities or um, others that are supports in their life. And maybe it's the big mama in the family. I'm looking at you, Anora, or as long as you get support too, um, or, or communities of faith or, or communities um, of support that, that can help walk us through our journey of coping. Um, if certainly if, if the mental health issue becomes a more uh, significant issue such that it impairs uh, functioning and, and coping day to day, then it may require uh, a mental health professional. But for, for many people, it's a matter of finding your people that you can walk with. Um, one of the things I pre-COVID facilitated weekend re retreats for, for women uh, recovering from breast cancer. and. They, you know, by, by about the second day, they really didn't need me one bit because they were well on their way to supporting one another and learning with one another. And I think that's an important thing to remember, such as the, the community that you've created through NCCS as well. And I think that's a place where advocates can really be helpful. When I look at um, helping people access care um, and all the different things we do as advocates, in my mind, that's the most important thing, to be able to just be there and listen and look for signs that people are, are able to really talk with you and say, you know, this is really what I need, or being able to say, this is what helped me to make people feel less hesitant to take, take advantage. I think that's really, I, I don't think we can say how important that is for people to hear, well, you know, I experienced this, it was different than how you experienced it, but we all can figure out a way to help each other find some relief. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. And even more so, I'm gonna go a little bit further. The patient advocate themselves, sometimes yes. you need to learn to say no or, or know our limitations mm -hmm. too, because we can't be the superhuman person for everyone. We have mm -hmm. to really, really recognize our, our place in that in that too, and hand it off to someone if we can't do it without the guilt. And we need to be able to evaluate when we're being effective and when we're not being effective. And that has more to do with our emotions probably than any other single thing that we accomplish. There are a lot of um, hospitals and, and community nonprofits who have peer mentor programs with uh, cancer patients being linked with other cancer survivors. And um, often in those trainings, that very thing about recognizing our own limits and when we need to take a break uh, is so important. I also want to point out one thing as we think about the role of chaplaincy, you know, they are um, under-recognized in the, in the everyday context of consultations and presence, but they have a tremendous role, tremendous value uh, when it comes to cancer patients and families, you know, when I think about my role as a clinician, you know, we're so focused on getting the patient kind of in a, you know, curative state or a wellness state um, and thinking about the next treatment plan or common side effects of a treatment plan. And we're forgetting kind of sometimes the existential matters that patients and families are going through, especially in survivorship. When you have this new phase that you're going through, you have this new sense of outlook. And a lot of times healthcare providers don't do a good job addressing that new purpose, that new meaning and that value that uh, cancer survivors may be facing. And that in itself, if we don't address that, that in itself would exacerbate some of the mental health uh, issues that survivors face. So I think being able to know what the patient needs back to Patsy says, you know, is this what this person needs at this time? 
uh, knowing that people cope very differently and knowing what we think is important for a survivor may not be what they're focusing on. Um, and really they just want, to, you know, sometimes it's about finding your new mission. Uh, so I think recognizing what patients want, especially if it's chaplaincy is critical. I think it's also important for people to figure out what is the thing that will help me most. What I'd say is the number one thing is to always have something to look forward to. Yes. Always. And that's different from every, for everybody. But if you're just kind of living, just kind of hanging around today, um, I don't think that's going to give you a lot of purpose in life. So I think that always have something to look forward to um, is something that is really important for spirit mind people are. So I have another question from the, an audience member. Um, so the question is, COVID has stripped patients and providers from the benefits of physical touch or hugs and smiling faces. What are some creative ways that cancer centers and, and cancer practitioners are trying to be more human and showing that care that's so important, especially when going through a difficult you know, journey like a cancer treatment? Well, I think the obvious for me is that I do a lot more exercising on Zooms now, um, mm -hmm. you know, through lots of different places, not just cancer centers, but um, my cancer center offers wonderful programming um, through, through the Zoom. So that's one way I think to kind of keep in touch because so many cancer patients and um, survivors tell me that they've lost that opportunity that they had to be like, very active in their favorite way. Like they may have been a really good tennis player and now they're just trying to get up off the couch and walk to the mailbox. So I think um, looking for those kind of opportunities are, I know they're obvious, but they may not be obvious to everyone. So I'd like to mention them. Yeah, I also think, um, I, I think that cancer survivors are a varied lot. <laughs> And um, I saw in, in, in the Q&A a question about developing survivorship programs, and I represent oncology social work uh, on the Commission on Cancer, which is responsible for setting the accreditation standards for, for um, cancer centers. And as, as we all know, not one size fits all. And one of the reasons that cancer centers had a hard time meeting the previous survivorship standard is that, that we're still figuring out what effective survivorship programming looks like. Um, and so one of the things that has surprised me in, our, in my setting is that we have an exercise physiologist and the men with prostate cancer love those exercise programs. Um, and so it a, I think part of it was an opportunity to regain some control and some self-efficacy. And those are all now on Zoom. So people can do it from, the, from their own home. And um, I think some of the, the programming that that we've had to pivot toward in this pandemic are things that I hope we continue to do. You know, like some of our virtual support groups and some of our programming, our, we have a mindfulness-based stress reduction course and a yoga class and writing workshops. All of those are possible on Zoom, which is really wonderful. Well, that does lead though to the question about disparities in access, because we talked before in our last panel about the digital divide. And so if we're going to offer all of these services by Zoom, what about the people who really don't have that capacity? And one of the things I wanted to get to in the last panel, but we didn't have time, is just as telehealth by phone. Um, and I, I read an article in STAT yesterday talking about the need to retain uh, reimbursement for telehealth by phone because it does reduce that disparity in, in the digital divide and, and helps people with, you know, in rural areas that maybe don't have the broadband access or people that don't have the, the digital literacy to, to do a Zoom call. Um, is that a, is phone-based mental health support effective? And how do we make sure that by doing, offering these support, we did also see when we did focus groups last year with patients on telehealth, there was a high degree of acceptability for um, using telehealth for um, for mental health visits and especially for the folk, for the uh, support groups. It, you know, it makes it so much easier to get to. It alleviates that burden for people who already have a lot of appointments to go to, one less appointment that they have to go to. So it's a great option. But how do we make sure we're not leaving people out? And does phone based Again, I'm combining two questions in one, but um, this phone-based mental health support, is that effective? 
I'd love to hear Dr. Gray's comments on that. I, I would like to suggest it's better than no support at all. Um, it, it's, I've heard from both clinicians and patients that it's hard not to be in the same room with your client the way that traditionally we've done that. Um, and Zoom helps, but in the absence of Zoom, I think te telephone support can be really important. Our, our local VA has been doing that for several years to reach um, veterans in Oregon that uh, live in rural communities. And uh, the other thing that um, I've been working with our foundation to really start to address issues like, what if people don't have digital devices? Can we provide support through philanthropy? Uh, can we look at ways, uh, the Oregon Health Plan, which is um, um, our, our version of um, the Medicaid system here in Portland, Oregon, um, is being really creative in providing things like phones, um, air conditioners for people who need them, you know, all around the whole uh, preventive health kind of model. But I'd love to hear Dr. Gray's comment. I absolutely agree um, with everything you said, Susan. It, uh, you know, it, in talking to colleagues and patients during this time, it, ha it has been effective. I do want to say it is not going to work. It doesn't work for everyone, um, but especially those individuals who don't have internet access or have poor broadband, uh, phone is such a great alternative. And actually, a lot of the psychologists and psychiatrists I work with, they have found it to be um, just as good, if not better, uh, because they're not always having to compete for room space um, in, in busy clinics. They're not always having to kind of quickly go from one place to another. And patients can feel that, you know, in terms of when it comes to consultations. You know, one thing that they, that has been mentioned in my workplace and that's been mentioned in other sources as well is how difficult it may be for that first initial visit. Um, just because when it comes to telephone or video, you want, it's ideal to have a, a rapport already established with the clinician and the, you know, between the clinician and the patient. Uh, so that part has been challenging. But I also think that with uh, repetitive appointments, it makes it much easier. Um, so yes, it has been effective. I do think there is going to be a need for hybrid approaches for some patients and families. I do uh, think it allows families easier access as well to be involved if it's preferred with the patient. Um, and it allows for the clinician to really see the home environment uh, as limited as possible, but to really see are there sources of stress uh, that are contributing to those feelings of anxiety, depression, loneliness, depression, hopelessness? Um, and to the point about how can we keep this going and how do we make sure people are involved? You know, I think the, the honest answer is that we need it to be a priority. M mental health services, period, whether it's in-person, phone, or video, it needs to be a priority for organizations, for philanthropic organizations, uh, for institutions, because if you don't have your mental health your physical health is going to suffer. If caregivers don't have adequate mental health support, the patients are going to suffer. Um, and, you know, so I think it's important to recognize that mental health should not be left out, period. And we do have to advocate uh, as leaders, as clinicians, as researchers, as policy advocates, patient advocates, to really advocate uh, for uh, philanthropic funds, um, even if it's having someone go to the home and setting up, making sure that uh, the phones are, you know, adequately put into the walls, or if the cell phone is in use, um, you know, little things like that are easy barriers uh, that that we need to invest in. So well said, Dr. Gray. And if I could add, part of my uh, cancer survivorship journey has been uh, positive uh, talks with people who've called me on the phone. That's what's gotten me through this journey of cancer and any subsequent cancers that come my way. I feel at the end of the day, somebody really cares enough about me to pick up the phone, gives me that extra incentive and push to go ahead and, and keep living. And that's why I do it for my brother. Those virtual calls that I give him, give him just enough um, to keep going, you know, when the, when the going is tough. Can I add one more thing? Uh, as Benora was talking, I was thinking, oftentimes we know in the literature that patients and families are so interdependent on one another. 
And there's also a sense of buffering that happens, which I know Susan knows way more about than I do in terms of her expertise. But in terms of buffering, the patients and families and clinicians even are trying to protect one another. So sometimes uh, conversations that should be had with patients and families or patients and clinicians are not had. So having individuals that you can talk to who may be strangers initially or may not be as closely connected may be a perfect avenue for really um, addressing some of those mental health concerns. I think that's really a good point. And I think that the other thing is um, I'm one of the only person on the panel that has this expertise, meaning I'm the oldest one on the panel, because I remember quite well when um, telephone reassurance programs were all we had. And I will say that I think for some people, being able to talk on the phone, it's a lot easier to run outside in the backyard if you're talking to something that is maybe something you don't want to know everybody in the family to know about. And it, so it, in some ways it is more accessible. And I think the pandemic, a lot of cancer centers that I've worked with, that was the only thing they had and it keeps us in touch. So I think it's easy for, for us to think, well, gosh, this is better because, but wouldn't it be nice if we asked the patient which they preferred? <laughs> That'd be nice, Patsy. <laughs> you know, well, um, and I keep saying, you know, I'm looking forward to the day when we can just use the phone again and we don't always have to be on video for everything because then you have I'm to, sure you, you know, look nice and think about your surroundings and all of that. I mean, we used to just have phone calls and now we have everything is on Zoom. So I, I, I know that part of that is getting tired of looking at yourself on Zoom, but um, I, I think that we'll get back to the day where we can just talk on the phone at some point. I also think um, I, I appreciated everyone's comments and, and the idea of a hybrid model going forward in mental health, I think makes so much sense because there are those who prefer the phone, there are those who prefer in person, and then there are those who might be able to tolerate a, something in between. Our new director of palliative medicine uh, comes from Duke and he's triple boarded in psychiatry, um, internal medicine and palliative care. And, and we were having a conversation the other day about what he misses about seeing patients in person. And he said, I miss looking at people's feet. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, I could tell if someone was doing better when they came mm. to see me and they were no longer wearing their slippers, mm. but they were wearing cute sandals with a pedicure. And I said, wow, I'm gonna look at people's feet entirely differently going forward. <laughs> so I think, I, I hope we have a, a hybrid, a little bit of, of all. So I, I'd like to return to, I know we talked about it a little bit, but the, the question of um, health equity and how do we ensure that everyone has the access to mental health services and that we, re that we address any inequities in access to, but also I'm interested in what is, are there differences in the acceptance of mental, mental health support in different um, races and ethnicities and different communities? Again, I'm combining two questions into one. <laughs> Yeah, I am delighted that you asked both of those questions um, because it, you know, it goes along the line of a lot of my research and work now. Uh, one of my studies focuses on uh, policies, uh, caregiving related policies and evaluating that in the, in the context of serious illness. And, uh, and one of the goals that I really have for this uh, study is really thinking about coordinated care for the family caregivers as we think about inpatient and back in the communities. But for your first question, you know, insurance and policy, and I, I think attitude um, are kind of some of the three major factors in terms of uh, having equal access to mental health. And what I mean by that is we know that healthcare in general is often tied to employment. We know that mental health services is seen as a luxury. Uh, oftentimes, and um, and that's also balanced by insurance coverage that the individual has, and even that di dictates where they go and how often you, they're able to see those providers. Uh, and then also when I think about policies, you know, we created policies exactly how we wanted them to shape out, um, and it's up to us uh, as individuals to really advocate for these changes in policy. In my in my role, evaluating the existing policies to understand the 
the, uh, the important benefits of those policies, but also some of the drawbacks. Um, and be creative when we think about refinement of those policies. And then attitudes, you know, I think in general, recognizing and acknowledging that these disparities in mental health services and outcomes exist uh, is so critical. Um, so I would say insurance policy and attitudes um, for your first question. I think for your second question, when it comes to cultural differences uh, in mental health services and coping, you know, I have a dear friend, uh, Dr. Uh, Shogaskambe, who talked about the superwoman schema, which is uh, what uh, Ms. Menorah was talking about earlier when it comes to you know, African-American women feeling like they have to hold it down all the time, whether they're sick or not. And, you know, what we know in the literature is that there's different patterns that emerge uh, that examines African-American cancer survivors compared to others. So this means that due to historic and marginalized uh, marginalization and exclusion, uh, that we that's been in the history, African American women in particular face greater levels of negative support. Um, they're cult they often adapt culturally based coping uh, that may not be the kind of the status quo for healthcare systems. Um, and also, they use something called the superwoman schema, which is basically magnitudes of being resilient being strong and being independent and not asking for help when needed. And that happens during the cancer, that's often happen during the cancer process and even uh, follow, it, follow up in survivorship. Uh, but we don't know a lot about, uh, you know, this experiences of positive and supportive coping, non-contemporary coping mechanisms for women of color. Uh, but it's important that we do these studies. It's important that we recognize these differences because there's faith-based communities. There's, uh, there's um, community neighborhoods, you know, that where people, if one person is sick, everybody kind of rallies together often. Um, and then it's, and there's oftentimes a mistrust in the healthcare system for women of color, for survivors of color, uh, and there will be a reluctance for going back for follow-up care. Uh, but I, I guess the biggest point to this is that there are different ways in which survivors of color cope and have been coping since the initial diagnosis that we need to, um, acknowledge, be aware of, and make sure that they have support to have approach-oriented coping rather than maladaptive coping. And, and I, I completely agree. And I, um, the social determinants of mental health are phenomenal. So we know that zip code matters where you grow up, uh, affects every opportunity that you have, be it education, access to healthcare, access to healthy foods, um, clean air, green spaces, all of those things have an impact on mental health. And, and I think there's continues to exist great disparities uh, in, in that regard. In addition to all your wonderful work, Dr. Gray, um, I think that being creative about how we provide mental health services to communities that may either not inherently trust us or who have different cultural norms. So community health workers, you know, Oregon is a very white state with a very dark racist history. And uh, we, but we do have um, a pretty well-developed network of community health workers that are working with the Latinx population and also our tribes because we have five Native American tribes that um, also um, have a whole different collective belief system around mental health. And, and a community-based support. And that's a really important thing. So I think being really creative. I What I really, really hope to see from all of this, and I, I'm, I'm loving this conversation, is that one day that we'll see when police stop young black men or people of color that who have mental issues or concerns that a, a social worker is involved. I think we're getting to that point because um, a lot of the mental health facilities have been shut down that were standard from years ago. So you've got them in mixed populations. You have them mixed in nursing homes. You have them mixed with other people that they just can't get along with and they lash out and the police don't know how to deal with that. And so one of the things, like I said, we're seeing today is that um, playing out on TV nationwide. And so my hope is that one day we'll see this all corrected and uh, keep talking about it because it is very important. I agree with everything that's been said. And I think that 
um, probably the most important thing for me is that we all need to look in our hearts. And we all need to say, this is what I can do. Um, and I see me treat, being treated very differently than other people um, when I'm helping patients. And um, I, I guess, you know, we have to take that responsibility to say, if that person's not comfortable speaking out, then I'm gonna help them do that. Or I'm gonna speak out based on what I'm seeing that I don't like. I think a lot of that has, has to come back to us as individuals. And I also wanna add one more point to, to this particular conversation that hasn't been brought up yet. I think in terms of improving health equity in the context of mental illness and cancer, we need first more um, clinicians of color, researchers of color, yeah. leaders of color in terms of people at hospital and clinic settings. Um, and, and it shouldn't be that different. It shouldn't be that surprising um, because patients need to be able to see and relate to individuals who look like them and, who, and understand their context, their lived experiences. So I think there needs to be more work done in increasing the pipeline from middle school and high school, getting um, you know young people who, are, who have some sort of passion or interest in mental health and cancer to go up that pipeline, to shadow people, um, and to be able to understand that experience and pursue those careers. I also think one of my big takeaways I hope to instill in after this discussion today is the fact that we may need to address things outside of mental health in order to address mental health. Um, and sometimes that may be making sure that people have fresh produce. As Susan was talking, I was like, well, cancer survivors who are in poverty level, who spend all their money in cancer treatment, can't, maybe won't be able to afford fresh produce uh, to keep healthy living, a healthy living and lifestyle. So we need to make sure that we target maybe some non-mental health barriers before, in order to achieve mental health wellness. You know, we, we have a pretty lovely network of farmers markets here in Portland. And um, last year I have partnered with one of the farmers markets to um, give food vouchers to our breast cancer patients who um, were living um, in poverty and they could take the vouchers to the farmers markets. Um, and there was also a local musician who's pretty well known who partnered with the farmers markets to allow uh, people to use their food stamps and other um, subsidies to, to purchase healthy produce. And so I think that together we've, we've got so many creative ideas and, mm -hmm. and there's so much we can do together, um, but, but we've got to do it by thinking in new ways. And I completely agree with Dr. Gray that we have to recruit a workforce that really allows patients to walk in the door and see somebody who looks like me, um, not me, me, but, but people of, of color. I, I'm so grateful that I'm in a position to hire social workers and we made it a priority to hire clinicians of color and clinicians who are bilingual or, or multicultural because we wanted that. And when, when patients walked in the door to be able to meet somebody that looked like them. Um, and that doesn't mean they're exactly like them, but it may help to foster uh, more trust. I also think language plays a big role. A lot of times I'm working on a study that's looking at anxiety at the be very beginning of a cancer diagnosis. And what we're finding is that uh, patients of color do not use the same wording about certain mental health terms like anxiety and depression um, than what we often read in the literature. So I, I think we have to think about kind of the, use the language that they use to describe how they're feeling, even if it's not textbook. Mm. That's an important point. So I wanna um, ask one more question from the audience who, uh, an audience member who is a pediatric cancer survivor and a freshly minted master's of social work. Um, she asked, um, when considering an ideal model of psychosocial support for cancer survivorship programs, what do you envision and how do you think we can get there? Well, I, I, I guess I don't, I don't think there is one right way to do this, but I would like to see um, in an ideal world, more uh, embedded people uh, that have some training in, in background in mental health services that are right there in the clinics. You know, that, that it's, cancer patients are already tapped to find resources, to get to treatment, to navigate these hospital systems. And, 
And to also then have to go look for a therapist somewhere or a mental health provider is one more stress. And, and not that our systems are very well equipped to pay for all of this, uh, but I do think that in an ideal world, it would be an embedded person so that they're already right there and it would be a routine part of the care that's offered. We're not there yet, but that if, if we're gonna dream big, that would be one of my dreams. Mm -hmm. Dr. Gray, do you have anything to add? And the only point I was gonna add is this question reminds me of kind of the field of palliative care, which is a young uh, field um, in this compared to some of the other specialties. And you know, the big question has always been how do we integrate palliative care into standard oncology care? And there's been studies done that's looked at integrated models uh, at different time points in the illness trajectory to really look at patient outcomes. So I think we need to, from a research standpoint, more studies need to be done to really look at integrating mental health services into regular oncology care and kind of comparing those uh, with groups of individuals that don't receive that integrated mental health service as part of their care. Um, so looking at those outcomes would be important, but also kind of doing a kind of a step wedge process where you're looking to see, is this the right amount of dose of mental health uh, services? Do they need a little bit more? You know, so because we talk about the workforce shortage, and so we can't, um, we don't have abundant amount of resources and personnel. But I, I do think that a little bit of services and kind of seeing if patient needs more to kind of evaluate, um, you know, the impacts for their well-being would be important. And that's kind of like a step wedge uh, type of design where you're able to kind of see how much is the right dose. You know, and, and if I could just add, lastly, Shelley, I think in a, in some sense or so, we're we're all a little broken. But I, I keep seeing this quote that I keep kind of taped to my desk and I'm not sure who the author is, but it tells us that broken crayons steal color. So no matter how broken we are or, or so we still color, we still have value. And so um, this conversation today has alluded to that and um, I'm looking forward to more conversations of this. Of this. Yeah, I agree with that. And I also think that when we've talked about this earlier and um, is if we would just listen a little more, if we would just listen a little more, it, it, that's not even about how much money it would cost. But I think we also need to get behind policy and really um, demand the best kind of care because we know what people need if we will listen. And um, I think that's really important from a, one very small thing that I'd like to say this before we stop today is we need to quit referring people places and we need to spend our energy making sure they get there. Because that's what I have seen over and over, um, having been a social worker for 35 years, is you know, people like to refer, but they don't like to stop and see if people actually get the help that, that they need. So it's just some thoughts. Thank you so much to all of you for a wonderful discussion. You've given us a lot to think about and I, I really appreciate all of your points on that. I am grateful for your time and for your participation in this really important discussion.